Hey everybody, this is Analytical Survival, and today I want to talk about putting it all together. And by that I mean putting together all the essential pieces of survival and laying them out in a logical fashion. And by doing that, I want to ask the question, what kind of gear does one need to survive an extended disaster? In addition to this, what kind of training does one need? And perhaps most importantly, what kind of mindset is necessary? Now, I know the majority of folks don't want to think about disasters. Nobody wants to talk about ugly circumstances, and I certainly can understand that. Thinking about earthquakes, floods, and house fires is just downright depressing. It's even a little scary. Yes, I know that. But what's even more scary is the thought of your family needlessly suffering through a calamity, especially when you could have taken simple steps to avoid that needless suffering. Now, what kind of disasters are we talking about here? Well, I compiled a tentative list of possibilities. On this side, we have earthquakes, floods, fire, hurricanes, an industrial accident like a chemical spill, or a home invasion. Now, on the opposite side, we have types of disasters that fall into the without rule of law category or WROL. That is disasters that can result in large scale lawlessness and they are civil unrest or riots, pandemics like a virulent pathogen that spreads faster than we can contain it, a terrorist attack, a solar flare or an EMP which stands for electromagnetic pulse, a sudden currency devaluation which could cause a run on the banks and finally a large scale environmental disaster of some type. Now any one of these possibilities has the potential to place your family at great risk and danger. So, the question is, what are the minimum requirements needed to overcome an extended disaster of these types? Well, I've taken the liberty of breaking things down into nine essential areas. That's nine essential areas of preparation that I, Mr. Analytical Survival, feel that you need at the very minimum to survive an extended disaster. And here they are. You'll need a bug out bag, water, food, medical supplies, a communication center of some type, an alternate power source, weaponry, action plans, and finally, training. Now, it's my strong opinion that with these nine essential areas of preparation, you can survive just about anything that Mother Nature throws your way or anything that human nature throws your way. So let's go through each category one at a time. First, the bug out bag. If you have to evacuate your house for whatever reason, for whatever reason, this bag contains 72 hours worth of your most basic provisions. It's just something that will keep you alive until you get situated elsewhere. That's all it is. Now, for the past 15 years, I've kept these two bags at the ready. This one is for me, and this one is for my wife. Now, excluding any water, they each weigh only 25.6 pounds. And as you might guess, they contain just about everything to keep you going, like a water filtration system, a complete first aid kit, as you see here, laid out on the table, a cooking system for boiling water or preparing food, a two-season compact sleeping bag, and a poncho for making an improvised tent or to use as a rain cover, a means for carrying water, a complete survival and hygiene kit, as you see here, laid out on the table again, which includes a means for starting a fire. A compass protractor and calculator for land navigation. Very important. In addition, this bag contains a handheld ham radio with a repeater directory, as well as a handheld police and emergency scanner, which lets you gather intelligence and also monitor what's going on in your immediate vicinity. Here's a headlamp, useful for hands-free operation. And obviously, you're going to need a means for self-protection, and therefore, my Springfield XD 9mm pistol. And don't forget the means to service it. And so here's a weapons cleaning kit. And folks, I'm only scratching the surface here. There's much, much more in this bag that I just don't have the time to cover. But this gives you a basic and general idea of the stuff that I carry in my bug out bag. Now, these two bags here are symmetrically loaded out. Now, you may be asking, what a symmetrical loading mean? It's simply a fancy phrase that means that each bag here contains the exact same items. Now, why do that? Isn't that more expensive? Yes, it is. However, in the event that my wife and I ever get separated, we can both survive on our own until we eventually reunify as a group. Also, it allows us the ability to split up temporarily if we need to and act as an independent unit. In other words, two symmetrically loaded bags are a force multiplier.
Now let's talk about water. Again, in the event of a disaster, you're going to need water, period. You can't get around this, folks. These here are called water bricks. They're one and a half gallons each, and they stack up and store very nicely. But more than that, they have handles and are small enough to be loaded onto a vehicle and can thus be taken with us on a vehicle if need be. But wait, you say, this is hardly enough water for a family of three. You're right, it isn't. That's why we also catch our own water from the sky and for free, mind you. Here's our rain catchment system. I built it myself and designed this entire system, and it stays well stocked with fresh rainwater throughout the year. It has a near 600 gallon capacity, and I designed it with a pressure switch pump that pumps rainwater directly to our greenhouse. And from there, we can filter and purify our water on an as needed basis. During non emergency times, we use this free water source to irrigate our organic garden, as you see my wife doing here. Okay, let's talk about food. Again, self-explanatory. In other words, you're going to have to eat sometime. These jars here contain dehydrated foods, carrots, green beans, sweet corn, broccoli, bell pepper, etc. Here's some grains and rice sealed in mylar bags. And here we have more dehydrated food. This is actually in our kitchen. This is the area where we keep all the dehydrated food that we rotate in from our storage. I built these shelves many, many years ago, and they have served us well. This food here is in our storage area. Here we have number Number 10 cans of various food types. Now, number 10 cans are actually very, very special in that they have a shelf life of 25 years or more. And on the bottom here, more dry beans, grains, and pasta. Now, in addition to all this, I'm a very strong believer in mobile food storage. These bins here can be rolled out to a vehicle at a moment's notice if need be. They're just something to augment our bug out bags. Now, what's in these bins, you may ask? Just water and MRE. Simple. Now, let's talk about fresh food for just a moment. Everyone should at least look into the potential of growing their own food. No matter where you live, it's possible to grow your own food. Here's our own garden. The garden itself is situated within a greenhouse, which again, I built myself. And here are some quick photos of that process. I install twin wall polycarbonate windows, which provides better insulation than glass. The planters I built myself as well, along with the planter stands that you see here. Finally, I designed these sliding windows to allow for passive ventilation, and they work very well, and they cut down on our energy bill to boot. Now, all this is to show you that anyone could provide fresh produce, fresh veggies for their own family. You just have to figure out how to do it in your particular climate. And don't forget emergency seats. Always keep these on hand in the event of an emergency. You never know when you might need them. Let's now look at medical supplies. Folks, in an extended disaster, calling 9-11 will most likely not work. Or if it does, it's going to take them many, many hours or even days to get to you. If they ever do. If they ever do. Until then, you're on your own, folks. This is our own medical bag here. I created it and researched and stocked each item myself. And since I'm an ex-Green Beret with an 18 Delta specialty, I myself am quite schooled in the area of trauma medicine. However, if you yourself lack training, don't be afraid afraid to take the requisite classes to become proficient. And I'll be talking more about that later. Bottom line, don't just have the first aid gear, but know how to use it as well. Now, in addition to this medical trauma bag, I also built a home-based treatment area. Here's our mobile bag, the one I just showed you. It's there when we need it, but we also have these other supplies at the ready for a home-based emergency. This way, we don't need to dig into the main bag, which I keep tightly inventoried. Okay, next category, communications. Folks, again, in a serious disaster, I can almost guarantee you that the communication lines will be cut off, and that includes cell phones as well. Now, what do you do if this occurs? Simple. Have a backup communication center, and this will always include a few key items. First off, get a scanner. And you'll need a scanner antenna as well. And here's ours out on the roof. Now, folks, the benefit of a scanner cannot be overstated. Instead of relying on local TV news to tell you what's happening in and about your immediate area, a scanner is going to give you the ability to scan police and emergency channels yourself in real time so you can gather intelligence firsthand and know what's going on in your area way, way before the radio or television even reports on it. And that's if they ever do, which means 
notice that you can react faster to potentially dangerous changes in your immediate area and with more accurate information at hand. Next, get a ham radio. Here's our Yezu FT897. And here is our microphone. And here also is our dual band antenna, again, out on the roof. Now, the great thing about an FT897 is that it can transmit both in UHF, VHF, and high frequency. However, be aware that in order to transmit in high frequency, you're going to need a special FCC license. But we'll talk more about that later. Now, in addition to using local repeaters, I have a high frequency antenna as well. It's called a buddy pole, and I can deploy this on an as needed basis. Finally, you're also going to need a mobile communication setup. You're basically going to have to get everything I just explained, but in a mobile format. So if you're on foot or in a vehicle or even at home, these are going to become invaluable. First off, get a shortwave radio. This is going to give you the ability to pick up international news broadcasts. Next, get a handheld scanner. Again, this is going to give you the ability to hear firsthand what's going on in your immediate area while you're on the move. Next, get a handheld ham radio. If you're on the move, you can use local repeaters to communicate with other ham radio operators who are many, many miles away. And finally, get a good pair of walkie-talkies. It doesn't matter which brand. Just something to talk to team members with while you're in and around the compound. Okay, let's talk about alternative power. Everyone, everyone should have a generator of some sort. And I know there's all different types of generators. We ourselves have a Honda gas power generator. This unit in particular is known for its quiet operation. It's very light and thus can be carried to a variety of locations. Or you can cart it just as easily. Now, a much more stealthier option for alternative power would be the juice box, which you see here. It's made by hardened power systems, and it's a great unit. It's powered by a battery bank of lithium iron phosphate batteries, which can be recharged with the built-in 10 amp charger. Here's the solar input, and this unit has already built in it a 10 amp solar controller as well. So you can hook it up to a 120 watt solar panel, like ours that you see here, and that will allow you to charge the battery bank silently. You can plug in small household items here into the 115 volt sockets. You also have Anderson poles here and then three amp USB charging ports here. Now, for everyday battery power devices, everyone should have a good supply of single-use alkaline batteries, everybody. But for the most part, however, we try to use rechargeable batteries whenever possible, and we have a large assortment at the ready. We have AA nickel metal hydride batteries, and to charge them, we use our Nightcore charger. It's an intelligent charger, so once a battery is fully charged, it cuts off power to that particular cell. This charger also can accommodate different sized batteries like our AAA batteries here as well as our rechargeable CR123s that you see here as well. In fact, an interesting thing to note here, all of our mobile communication devices run on AA batteries, even our night vision devices, and that's a huge advantage. Now, why do I say that? Because the more you can streamline your operations with battery compatible devices, the better off you're going to be in the long run. Okay, let's talk about weapons. Folks, in a grid down situation, you're truly, truly going to be on your own, and that includes personal protection. Now, for some of you, that may be a shocking and alarming realization. Well, get used to it. But more than that, get over yourself. Put your cushy, idealistic presumptions about the good nature of society, put all that aside, and start thinking about the ultimate safety of you and your family. Besides, if you can't survive an attack, then all your preparations are for naught. Remember that. All your preparations are meaningless without the built-in presumption that you'll be there to use them. I hope that makes sense. Now, for close-in engagements, it's hard to beat a shotgun. It's really, really one of the most versatile weapon systems available, particularly for home defense. Now, there are a lot of brands out there, Benelli, Remington, Mossberg, and all of them are great. All of them have their great points. Here's my own shotgun. It's a 12-gauge pump-action Mossberg 590A1 special purpose. It holds eight rounds in the tube and one in the chamber for a total of nine rounds. It also has a 20-inch heavy heavy walled barrel which is ported and truth be told all of this puts it on the long and heavy side. 
I mitigated some of that by replacing the buttstock with a shorter one, which you see here. And that brought the length of pull from 14 and a quarter inches to 12 inches, which essentially made it a little more maneuverable in tight quarters. I also replaced the rear ghost ring sight with a Burris red dot sight. And I also replaced the original forend with a Surefire forend, which has a built-in light. In addition, I had the barrel backboard or Vang comped. I also added a shot shell carrier, which gives me an additional four shell carrying capacity and finally I left the trigger as is that is right from the factory it clocked in at around seven pounds now let's talk about the carbine for close in to medium range engagements an AR-15 is an excellent choice it's light and when properly cared for, it's reliable, it's accurate out to long ranges, and it's quite effective in a multitude of roles as well. Mine is a hybrid. I built it myself with a Rock Rivers Arms lower receiver and a Daniel Defense upper receiver. I upgraded the stock here to a Voltar adjustable. Nothing special here, just Magpul and bus sights for the rear and for the front. And for an aiming device, I have an Aimpoint Micro T1 red dot sight. It's calibrated at two minutes of angle or two MOA. And as you can see here, it's on a LaRue LT660 lever mount. And for a little bit of extra protection, I put this Tango down cover on it. I changed out the stock trigger and I installed a Geisel designated marksman trigger, which I then adjusted to a three and a half pound trigger pull. I also swapped out the stock safety selector for an ambidextrous safety selector lever from Ares Armor, which in my opinion makes way, way more ergonomic sense. I also changed out the stock handguard and installed a 15-inch Viking Tactics Alpha Rail. And on a final note, my Daniel Defense Barrel Upper came chambered with a mil-spec 1-in-7 twist barrel. And that gives this AR the ability to stabilize heavier weighted bullets. Basically, it gives me the ability to use a greater variety of ammunition. Okay, that does it for the AR-15. Let's now move on to the pistol. Again, guys, there are many, many, many brands and makes to choose from. Some of the more popular are Glocks, especially the Glock 19 and the Glock 17, Smith & Wesson M&P, Springfield XDs, Beretta 6, 1911s, on and on and on and on. Then comes the caliber, the most popular being 9mm, 40 caliber Smith & Wesson, and 45 caliber ACP. Again, your choices are all going to depend on your preferences, your needs, and your purposes. Everyone is different. For me, I chose the Springfield XD in 9mm. Now, the 9mm round is an extremely popular round. I personally feel that it's going to be readily available to buy or trade, especially in a disaster situation. The very first modification I did was switch out the stock barrel, and I replaced it with a Barstow match grade barrel. I also swapped out the rear and front sights, and I replaced them with Dawson adjustable tritium sights. I also had Springer Precision work on the trigger, and down at their shop, they adjusted the trigger down to a two and a half pound pull. Now, that may be too light for some, but for myself, I'm quite used to it. Okay, that pretty much does it for the pistol. Let's move on to accessories. Now, if you're going to have weapons, you're going to need to have the proper accessories to go with those weapons. You really can't get around this. And this is especially true if you plan on taking pistol or carbine classes. So, if you're going to be taking pistol or carbine classes, and you should be, you're going to need an equipment belt or a battle belt, as it's sometimes called. Trust me on this one. You're going to need it. It'll make your world a lot easier. This one here is mine. It's made by High Speed Gear. And here's my holster, which is made by G-Code, a great company, by the way. Both of them are great companies. They make awesome holsters and awesome belts. Now, you're also going to need magazine pouches. These here are also made by High Speed Gear. They're called taco pouches, and they're very, very popular. I'm sure you've all seen them before. Next, you're going to need a dump pouch. This one in particular is made by Maxpedition. Again, you're going to need this to dump or store ammunition, extra magazines, a magazine loader, whatever, anything and everything you need to keep going in class. Now, let's move over here to the medical kit. Here's a tourniquet, and here's a first aid kit, and here's a photo of all the items within it.
So there you have it, a training belt or battle belt as it's sometimes called, all properly accessorized and ready to go for your classwork. Now let's talk a little bit about interchangeability. Now what do I mean by interchangeability? It's very simple. You're going to want after a while to have the ability to change the accessory layout on your training or battle belt depending on which class you're taking. So if you'll allow me, let me show you how I solve this issue for myself. Now, you can adopt this method or not. It doesn't matter to me. I'm just showing you what has worked for me over the years. For me, the best magazine pouches out there are high-speed gear taco pouches. Why is that? Because they're versatile. They automatically adjust to various sized magazines. Here, for instance, are my AR taco pouches, double and single. Over here are my pistol taco pouches, and here are my shotgun shell strippers. Now, on the rear of each of these accessories, I placed RTI hangers, and they're made by G-Code as well. In fact, I took the liberty of indicating where I bought each item from here. Now, on the training belts itself, you're going to place what are called RTI adapters. Okay, now, if I'm attending a carbine class, I simply attach the carbine pouches. If I'm attending a pistol class, I attach the pistol pouches only. And if I'm attending a shotgun class, easy, I attach only the shotgun strippers. How about if you're attending a carbine slash pistol course? Simple, you attach both the carbine and pistol pouches. In fact, you can arrange these or mix them up and match them any way you want, but the dump pouch, tourniquet, and first aid kit, those always stay in place. Those stay in place no matter what class you're taking. Now, let's talk about plate carriers. In the event that society collapses to the point of serious civil unrest and continual rioting, you may very likely find yourself at some point defending your life or the life of a loved one. And let's face it, that in itself may involve an actual firefight. If and when that happens, make sure that you've considered ballistic protection for yourself and for other family members as well. And that's where plate carriers come in. Now, you don't have to make this complicated. You don't have to go get something very fancy, nor do you have to put a million gazillion molly accessories on it. Just keep it simple. Just get something that you could sling on in a hurry. I have two sets of plates, and I'll try to make this as straight forward and simple as possible. One is for pistol level threats, level 3A, which stops most pistol calibers and types. And these are extremely light, by the way. The set right here, a much heavier set, is for rifle level threats. These here are level 4 ceramic plates, which stops most rifle calibers and types. Now, I bought these plates some time ago, and I don't know what type of newer plates are available now. So please, do your own research, but make sure, at the very least, that you have some type of protection. I know, I know, plate carriers may seem over-the-top and radical to some viewers, but they won't seem that way when you need them. I therefore strongly recommend that you consider this option. Okay, enough about play cares. Now let's move on and talk a little bit about ammunition. Regarding the storage of ammunition, I found that the military 50 caliber ammo can works the best. As always, make sure that the rubber seal is intact and in good working order. No brittleness or cracks. But that being said, there's a lot of ammo storage options out there. So you use what works best for you. As you see here, I always clearly identify what I store. I suggest you do the same. Note the amount, type of round, the grain or weight of the bullet, caliber, and any other special characteristics, and also the purpose for which it'll be used. Now, in each can, throw in a desiccate. Hybrosorbent is a good brand. That's what I use, and for good reason. What's the good reason? It's reusable. Here's what they look like up close. When the circular window right in the middle there is blue, they're fully charged and working. When that window turns pink, they need recharging. All you have to do is throw them in an oven at 300 degrees Fahrenheit for three hours, and that that's it. They're ready to be used again. Now, the question that always comes up to me is, how much ammo should I store? And the simple answer is, as much as you can afford. But as a baseline for a disaster situation, I'm going to refer to James Wesley Rawls, who recommends, quote, 2,000 rounds per carbine. 
1,000 rounds per pistol, and 500 rounds per shotgun, end quote. And don't forget ammo for your hunting rifles. 500 rounds for each hunting rifle should suffice fine. Now, keep in mind that these are just baseline figures. I'd personally store more if I could, but that's totally up to you and your budget. Okay, let's talk about ammunition for specific purposes, and let's start with a shotgun. For home defense, you're going to want to use something with sufficient stopping power, and for most preppers, that's the venerable double lot buck round. Now, let me share with you a list of commonly used home defense rounds for the shotgun. Sure, there's likely a lot more choices than what's shown here, but this is just to give you, the viewer, a sampling of what's available. Now, this here is what I personally use. It's made by Federal. They're two and three quarter inch loads and they contain eight pellets per shell. Now, I've actually tested this round against a whole bunch of other brands, even more than what you see here. And the Federal Premium had the most consistent patterns at a distance of three, five, and 10 yards. But that was with my shotgun. Everyone's shotgun is different, especially given all the modifications that one can do to a shotgun. So I suggest that you find out what what works best for you and your particular setup. Now let's talk about slugs. They have their place, they certainly do, but in my opinion, the concern of over-penetration makes them mal-suited for close quarters home defense. Now, that being said, they are definitely useful for other specialized purposes, so for that reason alone, you should have a good supply of slugs on hand. And remember, slugs pack a mean kick, so get used to it. All I'm saying is, become familiar with how your shotgun reacts with different types of loads. Now, let's talk about AR rounds for training purposes. And for training purposes alone, there are two benchmarks that I use. Number one, I use whatever ammo that cycles cleanly through my weapon. And number two, I use whatever ammo costs the least. Now, for years now, I've been using Privy Partisan. It's an M193 round, 55 grain full metal jacket. I buy it in bulk in 1,000 round cases, usually for upcoming classes. For me, this has been great ammo, no problems whatsoever and I've been using it for years and years. Another good choice is Wolf Gold. It's a great training round. It works well with my AR. Now, let's turn our attention to AR self-defense rounds. Keep in mind, the following recommendations that I'm about to give you are just meant to offer some general ideas, ideas that you should further research. Now, why do I say that? Because self-defense rounds work better in certain rifles than in others, regardless of how great they claim to be, and that's quite normal. It's to be expected. You actually have to try it out, each brand and make of ammo, before you buy and bulk. How well does it work with my AR? How well does it work with the way I have it set up? That's something that only you can answer through experimentation and testing. The first thing to determine is the rate of twist of your barrel. Generally speaking, a faster rate of twist, like a 1 in 7 barrel, will stabilize heavier bullets more effectively. Now, if you happen to have a 1 in 12 twist barrel, you can still shoot heavier bullets, absolutely. It's just not ideal, and you won't get the maximum ballistic performance from your ammo. So, the question still remains. What is the best self-defense ammo for my AR-15? Here's a list of AR self-defense rounds matched specifically to barrel twist, chambered in 5.56. Again, these are suggestive options. You have to test these rounds individually. Then and only then can you determine accurately which ammunition performs best in your rifle setup. Here's another list of self-defense rounds matched to 1 in 7, 1 in 8, and 1 in 9 twist barrels, this time chambered in 223. And here yet is another list of self-defense rounds matched to 1 in 9 twist barrels. And finally, here's the list of self-defense rounds matched to 1 in 12 twist barrels. Final word, if you didn't see your favorite super-duper state-of-the-art Superman-stopping self-defense round listed here, don't go ballistic, pun intended. Just go ahead and add it to the list and then test it out alongside some of the others that you've seen here. Simple. Okay, let's talk about pistol ammo. For training, just use anything that's cheap and that works well with your pistol, period. For range use, I use Cellular and Bellet Range Safe Ammo. It's been my favorite for years and years. It burns clean, very reliable, no malfunctions, it's accurate, and somewhat inexpensive. PMC is another good choice. But again, 
the million dollar question is this. What is the best self-defense ammo for my pistol? Here again are lists of what many authorities consider the best self-defense pistol ammo. They're all broken down by caliber, so let's go through them one at a time. Here are the recommendations for 9mm. Just look over the list and pause the video if you have to. Here are the recommendations for 40 caliber Smith & Wesson. And finally, here are the recommendations for 45 caliber ACP. Now, while I haven't tried each one of these 9mm self-defense rounds, I've tried a good number of them. And what works best with my Springfield XD9 is Spear Gold Dot 124 grain hollow points. And as you can see here, I keep a good amount handy for the unforeseeable future. Okay, that does it for ammo. Let's briefly look at knives. Now, it's just a good idea overall to have a wide variety of knives where each one serves a specified purpose. The first one here is a Recon Scout made by Cold Steel, an excellent knife for heavy duty use, just a great all around bush crafting knife. Next is your typical M9 bayonet made by Ontario. Here is a Hisatsu folder made by Columbia River Knife and Tool. Now, this knife here was actually given to me by a good friend, James Williams, who himself is an expert samurai swordsman. It's a deadly instrument, let me tell you, and it makes an excellent self-defense knife. Next up is the Mil-Spec SE3, a great utility knife for around the campsite. And finally, here's my everyday carry, Kershaw Scallion. I've had this for years and I love it. The spring action is precise, very sharp blade, and it's just a good everyday knife for tackling the little jobs around the house. Okay, that does it for weaponry. Let's move on to action plans. Let me say this in no unclear terms. If you have all the gear that I've shown you up to now, and I mean all of it, and you fail to draft up action plans for specific types of emergency scenarios, you're going to be selling yourself short. You really will be. Your effectiveness will be, in essence, cut to a fraction. Every emergency situation, no matter how small, will have that uncanny ability to call your bluff. That is, if you haven't thoroughly thought out your action plans, the emergency situation, whatever it is, will probe your vulnerabilities until it finds your weak link. It's called Murphy's Law, and you all know what the heck I'm talking about. It will get you every time, guaranteed, and usually right when you least expect it. So, how do you mitigate this? Easy. Walk through each and every emergency scenario in your head, the ones you actually anticipate, and walk through them step by step. And as you do, start accounting for all the variables. Make a procedural list of how you're going to do things. How are you going to structure your approach? What are the tools that I'll be needing? What procedures will I be following? And in what order of precedence? Once you do this, let these procedures sit for a while, for about a week or so. In other words, let your ideas cool down then return to them do your procedures still sound good probably not and you may need to revise them well go ahead and revise edit things out or add things in that you previously overlooked in other words tighten the procedure after a few tries and after many late nights of work you'll eventually come up with a set of action plans that you're satisfied with now, that's exactly what I did here. These are my own emergency response protocols or action plans. I broke them down into a few likely scenarios. No, I didn't make a million lists. I only stuck to a few likely scenarios. In other words, keep it simple. Keep it straightforward. Now, in addition to this, I created removable cards so that any one of my team members or family members could remove them if need be. So, to summarize, I have emergency response protocols on both the action plan itself and on these removable cards. So, if we're rehearsing an action plan, we can follow along on these cards as we move through the plan, as we rehearse the plan. You can also use the cards during an actual emergency to keep you on track. Now, let's move on to training. Many, many, many folks over the years have asked me time and time again, what kind of disaster or prepper-related training can I get as a civilian? Not only is that a great question, but everyone should, in my experienced opinion, be training on a continual basis. And by continual, I mean one or two classes every month or every two months at the minimum. In addition, those classes should continually rotate through many different areas. And I've broken those areas down into three main categories. Medical 
communications, and weapons. And it's no coincidence that I've arrived at these categories. Why? Because the U.S. Army Special Forces teams are themselves similarly organized around these three areas. And there's really no reason for you as a civilian not to emulate this strategy. Of course, let's be realistic. You're never going to approach the expertise of a Special Forces ODA. I got it. But that's not your goal. It's really not. Rather, your goal is to merely replicate or just emulate this three-tier strategy to approach it as best you can. So to summarize, everyone on your team or everyone in your family should at the very minimum be cross-trained in each of these areas, medical, communications, and weapons. That way, if any one of you uh, moves on, gets separated, gets sick, or God forbid expires, you still have other team members who know each of these specialties. That's to say, you didn't confine a specialty to one individual person. You instead spread it around, and that way, the group will always retain functional capacity. It can always carry on as a functional unit without any loss of knowledge or capabilities. Okay, let's get started. Medical training. What can you do? For starters, everyone should know CPR. Everyone. The Red Cross gives half-day courses all over the country. Find one. In fact, take the course that includes adult and pediatric CPR and AED. That course teaches CPR for adults, infants, and toddlers as well as how to use an AED or automated external defibrillator. Next, wilderness first aid. Everyone, everyone on your team should take this course everyone. Again, wilderness first aid courses are given all over the country and by different outdoor organizations. Find one. It's a two-day course, eight hours per day, and it's usually given on a weekend. Next is wilderness first responder. Now, you can and perhaps should designate just two members of your team to take this particular course. Preferably, they should both take the course together. Now, why do I say that? Because it's expensive and time-consuming. It's an eight-day course, eight hours per day, and it usually costs around $700 or so per person. Per person. Again, they're given all over the country by different outdoor organizations, even some medical universities offer this course. But they're a little harder to find, but you can still find one. You might just have to drive a ways to get there. Well, well worth the money if you ask me, because they really, really dive deep into advanced first aid techniques, ones that are geared especially towards outdoor environments. Look it up, research it, and sign up. Now, one of the most valued hidden treasures out there, one of the most incredible training experience I have ever undergone as a civilian, and one that almost no one is talking about in the prepping community, is CERT, or your Neighborhood Community Emergency Response Team. A couple of things that make it incredible. Number one, it's free. Yes, you heard correctly, it's free. Number two, you can take the eight-day course over two months in the evenings, and they usually do one evening class per week, and it's usually usually given by your local fire department. Number three, it's an excellent, excellent course to take with your entire team or with your entire family. It really is. It's an excellent team building experience. It's actually designed that way to be group interactive. More than that, it's very user friendly. They won't make you look foolish. They take you right where you are and they walk you slowly through everything and they give you lots of practice time. The entire training will culminate in an eight-hour practical exam. It takes all day from morning to late afternoon, and the entire team pulls together to help everyone pass. It's really an amazing experience, and the little graduation ceremony at the end is very nice as well. Again, look it up, research it, and sign your entire family or your entire team up. Now, let's move on to communications. This is actually the very area where most preppers are lacking. They really are. I know, I know. <laughs> Radios aren't that sexy. Well, maybe to some they are, but for most of us, no. They actually can be a little intimidating, but that doesn't have to be the case. Where then should I start, you ask? Why not start with your FCC tech license? That's right. Become a licensed ham radio operator. And to do that, you need to take the tech license. License. Now, there's an easy way to do this. There's an easy way to do this. Listen to what I'm about to say. Go to HamTest Online, 
create an account, and I guarantee you, within a month, you'll have your tech license. No problem. And with Ham Test Online, you'll actually have fun doing it. Really, you will. And no, they didn't pay me to say this. It's just that good of a program. So to summarize, forget all the Ham Test manuals. Just go to Ham Test Online, make an account, and get started. Now, while you're at it, why not, after some time and experience under your belt, move on to your general license? That's right. Just keep going. And then, when you're finally ready to make the leap, go for the amateur extra license. Again, with Ham Test Online, you're actually having fun doing it. So look it up, research it, and sign up. Now, there are a lot of other ways to advance your training and communications, and it doesn't have to center around examinations. If you really want to learn about emergency communications from the ground up, then you can join one of two organizations. You can join ARIES, which is an acronym that stands for Amateur Radio Emergency Service. It's run by the ARRL, and according to their website, it, quote, consists of amateur radio licensees who have voluntarily registered their qualifications and equipment for communications duty in the public service when disaster strikes, unquote. So look that up, research it, and see if it's something that you're interested in. RACES, that's another emergency communications outfit. It's an acronym that stands for Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. RACES volunteers are able to communicate on amateur radio frequencies during drills, exercise, and local and national emergencies. RACES is actually an extension of the government itself, so you'll usually be working with local, county, or state jurisdictions. Again, look it up, do your research, find out more information about both ARIES and RACES. They're Excellent, excellent venues for expanding your emergency communication skills. Now, let's talk about weapons. The very, very first thing you should consider if you're new to shooting is a beginning pistol course. And if you're new to the AR-15 platform, likewise, take a beginning carving course as well. Most gun ranges or gun clubs have formal courses that you can sign up for, and usually for a very moderate fee. Now, in this area alone, we have about five or six public ranges located all around me. And each one of them offers pistol courses or carving courses. So do your research, ask around, and find out where the best instructors are, and then take a course. Now, when you eventually get comfortable with both the pistol and carbine, and when you feel you're ready, take an intermediate pistol and carbine course. That'll take you to more advanced concepts like drawing from a holster, combat reloads, shooting with a non-dominant hand, the kneeling position, the prone position, and so on and so on. Then, when you feel you're up for it, take it a step further and take a shotgun course. You'll learn all the special loading and manipulation techniques that are particular to the shotgun, but you'll definitely definitely want to take a course like this that is one that's solely dedicated to the shotgun. So what I'm saying is get to know the shotgun platform as well. Get comfortable with it. Now, what do I do next? Take a combined pistol and carbine course. Why? Because they'll teach you how to properly transition from your primary to secondary weapon. And you'll also get familiar with manipulating both platforms simultaneously. Now, it's at this very point where you'll begin to feel as if you're finally beginning to get comfortable. You're finally beginning to understand both the pistol and carbine. You're not afraid of them. You know the basics of how to handle them safely. And you know the basics of how to operate them effectively. So the question is, where do you go from this point? Well, when you feel you're absolutely ready, take it up a notch and join some local competition matches. Nothing major, just something at the entry level, at the beginner level. But why competition, you ask? That's a very, very good question, Grasshopper. The main reason that intermediate shooters eventually join competition matches is because it adds a healthy level of stress. And that stress can push you to perform better than you previously thought. How does it do that, you ask? Well, just think about it for a moment. First off, you're competing against your peers. Second, you're being timed. Third, you have to be efficient at quickly and safely drawing a loaded weapon from the holster. And fourth, you have to shoot on the move, engaging different types of targets and obstacles. See what I mean? It's a very, very different experience. But there are different levels of competition, and that's a good thing because 
After a while, you're going to want to take it up another notch, and this time at the intermediate competition level. The stress level will obviously increase, yes, but by this time, you'll have met a network of both instructors and friends, all of whom will be willing to work with you. They'll be supporting you, and you'll learn tips by observing these shooters, by seeing what kinds of pistols they shoot, what kind of ammo they use, what kind of techniques do they use, and so forth. Now, let's talk a little bit about advanced pistol or carving courses. Truth be told, at this very level, you're not going to want to skimp. You're not going to want to cut corners, and you're going to want to find the very, very best instructors, ones that are going to push you to excel beyond your comfort zone. And in this particular area, I would highly, highly recommend Northern Red Training. They travel all over the country, so look them up and find out when they'll be in your general area. And with instructors like J.D. Patinsky and Tom Spooner, you're going to get your ass kicked, but in a good way. Trust me, they'll definitely send you home rethinking your entire approach. And at this level, that's what you want. That's exactly what you're looking for. You want to be pushed to that next level of proficiency, but that usually only happens after you've crushed some old, outdated habits. Now, I want everyone here, everyone to at least consider, at least consider becoming an NRA instructor as well. Now, why do I say this? Well, because I know that the highest level of learning only happens when you actually teach something, when you actually are imparting knowledge. Becoming an instructor actually forces you to master the material. It forces you to know your stuff because you're going to be teaching it. And that's why I think becoming an NRA pistol, rifle, and shotgun instructor is useful. And pretty soon, you'll be teaching others, and you'll be passing on these valuable skills. So if you're up to it, go to the NRA website, enter your zip code, and all kinds of NRA instructor courses will come up in your area. Sign up, take the challenge, and take it to that next level. Okay, that concludes the information portion of this video. The rest, as they say, is really up to you. To quote James Wesley Rawls, quote, you can own the very best guns or knives and have the very best holsters and accessories, but they will be marginal at best in untrained hands. If you are serious about preparedness, then you should get the best training available. Remember, tools without training is almost useless, end quote. And I I personally second that notion. Folks, preparedness is really a mindset more than anything else. And that mindset is forged and shaped through training. It is then and only then that the tools of survival actually take on their full significance. Only then will your gear and equipment take on a deeper meaning. But up until that point, your gear is just manufactured stuff. Listen, let me give you an analogy. You take a person who has had no training, put them in the woods, and then through an accident or mishap of some sort, they lose all their gear. They won't know what to do. They'll lose it. Why? Because they had a shallow mindset that was immaturely tied to the primacy of their gear. Wrong move. Take another person, this time with training, put them in the woods, and if and when they lose their gear, they will assess their situation, remain focused, and will make their own improvised tools using bushcrafting skills, and that will make the difference, the difference between life and death. And that's because this person's mindset in the latter example was tied to the primacy of their learned abilities and not their gear. Their gear was merely a co-extension of their learned abilities. And when they lost their gear, their learned abilities remained intact in their mind and in their spirit. And that was enough to make the decisive difference. Now, take a look here for just a very quick moment. These are all the training certificates, all of them from different courses that my wife and I took over the years, from medical classes to communication classes to weapons classes, even rock climbing classes and land navigation classes, canning classes, you name it, and all kinds of other coursework as well. And you want to know something? I'm still learning new things to this very day. I'm continually taking new classes. I'm continually pushing the envelope. It's never ending when you really think about it. And that's because prepping is, in all actuality, a lifestyle. It's a way of life. Because once my learning stops, folks, 
Once my coursework ceases, then at that very point, all I got is gear. All I got at that very point is commercially made manufactured stuff. Remember that. Always remember that. All right, that's it for now. This is Analytical Survival signing off and saying, stay safe, my brothers and sisters. <laughs> <laughs>